Hello there, and happy Halloween. I'm Malpain27, and this is Dean of Doom. Today's episode will be dedicated to Ad Mortem, a 34 map partial conversion created by members of 4chan's Retro Video Games board and helmed by Veros. This Halloween community project was released in three phases between 2021 and 2023, finally reaching 99% complete status on Halloween night last year. With a greatly expanded monster roster, overhauled sounds, including diegetic effects, a fully reskinned pack of weapons, tons of new seasonal and macabre decorations, and all the orange, green, and purple textures you could ever want, Ad Mortem looks every inch the part of October dooming. This being a community project, things are a bit volatile on the level design side, but that's part and parcel of the experience. Sometimes the neighbors hand out full-size Snickers bars, and sometimes they shove a bowl of well-handled candy corn at you. If you're tuning in this year, you probably already know Dean of Doom by heart, so we'll skip the standard intro spiel. We're also going to alter the rules a bit, since I did not get the chance to play every one of these maps twice, nor did I insist on 100% kills. I did, however, tune the difficulty to Real Horror Show, I see what you did there, pistol started, and saved like the dickens. I played Ad Mortem v 1.5.6 with DSDA Doom, and its compatibility is MBF21. Now to the WAD. Map 1, Catacomb Over. We are off to a very good start. A feisty opener that spurns gentle tutorializing, Catacomb Over unveils most of the new monsters, pickles your brain with seven secrets, and acquaints you with your remodeled arsenal in sink or swim fashion. Skulking by the crypt out front are Ad Mortem's first two skeletons. Left unchecked, these speedy discount revenants fling humorous quantities of humoruses at you, and their jib animation is one of Ad Mortem's greatest pleasures. Gargoyles fill the role of aerial cannon fodder. They'll doggedly flame you and split like overripe tomatoes if you even graze them with your Winchester. You'll need something heavier for the satyr, who stomps around self-importantly and double fists fireballs at your face. Who does he think he is? The rockets with legs are the worst thing to haunt dark corners since Scythe 2's evil marines, and right at the exit, King Boner the Stiff arrives. You heard that right. Maximally juvenile name aside, I love these screaming lunatics. They're the perfect augmentation of a perfectly calibrated enemy. I love to hate them. Nothing about the weapons has functionally changed, but I needed time to get used to the smooth animations, especially with the Bone Crusher. I'm not gonna call the Super Shotgun the Bone Crusher, but the 90mm anti-tank rocket launcher has a nice ring to it, and I love that Berserk is just a really spicy ham dinner that makes your face red. Ad Mortem's appeal lies somewhere in the clash between cuteness, crassness, and Halloween hijinks. Part of me thinks Catacomb Over's toilet papering of the player is meant to be a sort of initiation to the full moon madness that follows. Grade B+, plus, difficulty B+. Plus. Map 2, Kako's Keep. Ad Mortem's first anonymous submission, Kako's Keep seems like rookie work. Most of its fights over-prepare you, there are quite a few texture misalignments, and the rudimentary decoration just doesn't pull me in. The red skull key reveals three arch vials, which momentarily jolt you to attention, but the rest is so humdrum that you won't even have to pull the trigger on your secret plasma. Kako's Keep is a good place to start talking about Ad Mortem's ambient sound design, though. For the most part, I like the environmental SFX and interactive props like these cross-legged skeletons, but there is one sound sample that does not work at all. Come on, guys. One of you's breathing into the microphone. There are a lot of excellent creepy scenes in Ad Mortem, but ASMR makes all of them less effective. As for Kako's Keep, it gets a beginner's pass and the excuse of Map 2 being a cursed slot. Grade D, difficulty D-. Map 3, Beneath Bloodstone. Reminds me of Requiem, actually. Ike Karanen would dig the railings, mineshaft setting, and strict ammo dieting. I have a feeling he'd also do a lot of this. Beneath Bloodstone is the first of many maps that require you to fight satyrs in confined spaces with a shotgun. It's such a pain in the ass. Their quick release allows them to slip fireballs under doors as they rise, and when shells are at a premium as they are here, it's doubly annoying when you whiff. Beyond this dumb encounter, Beneath Bloodstone becomes an atmospheric survival game. Leap along the cauldrons for a life-saving blur sphere, and remember to make your shots count. The monster minimalism and deep, dark environment work well together, but MIDI does not do this Nine Inch Nails track justice. Grade B minus, difficulty C. Map four, Pumpkin Delight. All you have to do to win me over is put sector pumpkins in your map. Enraged Eggplant gets a lot of mileage out of 50 odd monsters. With a little more height variation and a little less ammo, Pumpkin Delight could have been a crumpet. The SSG pit trap will only have its way with the Oblivious, and if you're patient enough to chip away at King Boner, you can shoot through the back way and avoid it altogether. The multi-part purple key slime fight is neatly executed, and the triplet of exit tricks is par for the course. 
Cute map. Grade B, difficulty C. Map 5, The Imps in the Walls. This Lovecraft-inspired adventure has one of the most electrifying opening shots I've seen in Doom, so crammed with lines that the Doom engine kneecaps it. But it's also got a very preventable mega slime trail right here, and that's this map in a nutshell. The Imps in the Walls is a fraught, fascinating marriage of high-effort artistry and terminal ambition that counterbalances Twilight Dread with some bonehead mistakes and almost pervasively awkward gameplay. ASO 3000 draws his world with a sharpened pencil. Open books, spiral stairs, upright pianos, easy chairs, brute force diagonals, and domed ceilings. All of this complies with a lifelike scale that sucks the excitement out of the map's encounters. The satyr fights are especially awful, but there's precious little room for anything but peekaboo and mindless trigger squeezing in corners as tight as these. The yellow key courtyard brawl provides a much needed leg stretch, and back inside, the first gargoyle swarm of the megawatt makes a dramatic entrance through a broken window. Both cell weapons become available when you have all three keys. The plasma is downstairs in the crypt, and you can tiptoe along the cliffside and teleport to the BFG. Brace yourself now, because no Doom guy, however well-armed, is ever fully ready for the town. This reveal is one of Ad Mortem's greatest moments. The weeping of this mass grave's last inhabitants is barely audible over the dying screams of their torturers and the crunch of bones under your boot. It's enough to make anybody go mad. But we all go a little mad sometimes. Grade A minus, difficulty B plus. Map six, the 64th dimension. All you need to make a Doom 64 map is a central building encircled by water, a cave, and a library. Add arachnitrons, mancubi, and pain elementals to taste. The 64th dimension starts as a simple super shotgun smash and bash, but the lava grotto dispenses some senseless viciousness, and the ungulate librarians can make mincemeat of a careless rocketeer. The Tommy gun's stunning power makes it the most reliable weapon to use on satyrs up close. I dislike this map's reliance on short-fused smother traps to increase difficulty, but it's a handsome and competent homage, and I like its exit sequence. Grade B-, difficulty B. Map 7, Darkwood. This valiant-esque canyon clear-out is drenched in purple and littered with snappy, barrel-assisted encounters. Everything revolves around the central tower, whose topmost teleporter leads to the exit. Depending on what number playthrough this is, the trap-heavy detour through the lodge proves either aggravating or exploitable, but the post-red key aerial assault is always a juggling act. Each Mankey turret you dismantle frees two Kakos, and jumping down surrenders a significant height advantage, so pick your moves carefully. After that hullabaloo comes a chaff-splattered cyber duel and two skinny swarms behind the exit door. The advantage you have over Skellington is that he has no brain. Stand one side of the cave mouth and the Skellies will stick to the wall and come out slower. Darkwood looks a little too polished standing next to its neighbors, but Rob does his thing and he does it well. Grade B+, difficulty B. Map 8, Little Church of Horrors. This once whole hideaway becomes a pleasant rest stop after you give the courtyard a thorough combing. Candles point the way to a mega armor and rocket launcher, and there's a ladder propped up against the cliff where the plasma rifle is perched. After subduing Pastor Vile in the choir, you can descend to the basement, which trades the merry crunching of leaves with agonized wailing and the hideous yips of a new enemy, the gremlin. These guys always come in droves, and even though they're earthbound, I find them much more irritating to deal with than the gargoyles. And why can't they jib? Help Sybe ride the lightning back to his lord and savior, and if you're a Reddit person, I would suggest avoiding the bedside Bible. Grade B, difficulty B minus. Map 9, Shadow over Silver Spring. Stubbornly cramped, stern with supplies, and overstuffed with fool me once ambushes, Shadow over Silver Spring does not make fast friends, but its central premise is clever enough to cancel out one or two of its rudest moments. This is Ad Mortem's secret map boarding station. There are three wall eyes hidden around the map, and interacting with each one whisks you away to a pocket dimension harboring a keycard. Ironically, most of the weird world fights are easier than the standard versions. Lack of big guns gives gives this courtyard archfile too much time to stir the cauldron, and there are three more archies in the dungeon who can cause a lot of misery if they're not contained. I have no idea what Bartek Mill was thinking with this double satyr, double KB trap. He may get a chuckle out of it, but it comes off as cheap. Oddly enough, the difficulty relents significantly down the stretch. You get a fully loaded BFG to topple the final teleport party, and if you check behind the stained glass window in the Revenant Hall closet, you'll acquire a crystal ball with instructions on how to find the secret keys. Silver Spring is a bit bloated, and its impoliteness casts a 
Long Shadow Indeed. Grade C minus, difficulty B plus. Map 32, Pumpkin Nation. Eric Alm sends his regards. This Scythe 2 send-up pits you against nearly two dozen Decinos in a dual-sized deathmatch map. The sun's sinking, so you'll have to fight by jack-o'-lantern light. Thankfully, these pumpkin heads lack the Dutchman's patience and precision. They're no different than Scythe 2 evil marines, and Beetle keeps most of them on a short leash. If there's an art to sniping these sinister squashes, I have not yet mastered it. I actually prefer when they're on the loose. Smacking a secret switch on the exit sign opens one last room with a nutmeg sphere and a pile of ammo. How many pumpkin pies can you make with a mega kill. Grade B minus, difficulty B plus. Map 33, tricks and treats. What am I supposed to make of a map with a secret that allows you to skip the whole thing? A bit more time in the lab would have done tricks and treats some good. This map has no concept of dramatic buildup. Three of its four secrets are right next to each other in the first room. The only monsters not clumped together with no rhyme or reason happen to be prickly long-range chain gunners and oh no arch files, and the red skull key you find in the ASMR cemetery opens a huge cache of supplies which totally diffuses the final fight. I am partial to family-sized secrets like this, but along with everything else in this map, it feels miscalibrated. On top of the ungainly delivery, Tricks and Treats is shabbily drawn and contains a stray teleporting line def here in the graveyard. You can see it on the auto map, so I'm not sure how it snuck past quality control. Tricks and Treats doesn't have enough personality to make me want to overlook such warts, and I think it was banished to, rather than designed for, the super secret slot. Grade D-, difficulty C-. Map 34, Uncle Reggie's Candy Factory. <laughs> Spelled Ungle Reggie in the text file, this map is rough as guts, smattered with slime trails, its line deaths and demons tightly clenched. I appreciate that its crampage is more of Swift Death's ilk than Requiem's, but there is a bit of Adam Windsor in its dense detailing, vertical compactness, and no-nonsense combat. One thing that bothers me about this map is its indifference to the theme of the community project it's in. It barely uses the custom monsters and doesn't really acknowledge any Halloween mainstays except candy, I guess. Someone involved in the Reddit VR whole War might have a laugh or a gasp at Uncle Reggie's Commander Keen replacement, but I sure as hell ain't showing it. Too edgy, five me. Grade C minus, difficulty B. Map 10, Memorial Island. The solemn Memorial Island is probably the strongest and most succinct work I've seen from Violent Beetle. Not a single monster is wasted in this funereal firefight. In fact, many of them will be recycled by the four vile sextons on duty. No doubt about it, the final fight is the most difficult and galvanizing combat set piece in Ad Mortem so far. Placing the Red Skull on its pedestal sets off a chain reaction of unholy resurrections that etches a fiery path to the Purple Skull. It's amazing how Beetle turns just 24 monsters into murderer's row. Revenants and flyers, followed by a block of relentless arachnitrons, a panic-inducing archfile, and a cleanup hitting crew of satyrs and skeletons. There's a brilliant soul sphere secret that provides some much-needed margin for error here, and if you can't find it, I can only suggest hiding by the canoe. The only thing dragging Memorial Island down is the northerly grave's ear-molesting sibilance, but it can be overlooked in a map that's otherwise cash money. Grade A, difficulty A-. Map 11, Bold Catechumen. Unnerving from top to bottom, Bold Catechumen places you in the glower of a non-aggressive archfile at the start of the map, and will keep your shoulders bunched with tension till the end. A scant 47 monsters populate this map, and half of them are waiting by the exit to jump you. If you found a secret weapon or two, the skellies, gargoyles, and two pair of kings and meatballs go down easy, but the mid-texture grass and leaves plundering your frame rate is the real enemy here. It's a little inert on the gameplay side, but as a creepy, well decorated world builder, Bold Catechumen excels. Witness this disturbing ceremony where you bleed out two vile acolytes to reach your super shoddy. Grade B, difficulty C. Footnote, I have a nagging feeling that I'm missing a lot of references in this wad, especially musically. I'm sorry, I don't know what an elfin light is. Map 12, every damn night, it's the same thing. A gargoyle wakes me up, I look out the window, and the motion sensor lights are going crazy. Lo and behold, the dead have risen and demons are walking the earth. Again. So I grab my coat and rocket launcher, shut them all up, and then realize, shit, I forgot my keys. I gather up some more guns and spray the gargoyle nest on the hill, that's no big deal. But then I go over to the disco to get my purple key, and every damn night there's a cyber demon who wants to do the Charleston with me. Of course, a bunch of his friends show up unannounced, and when they try to steal his dance, he goes ballistic and turns the monster's ball into a bloodbath. I firmly, but politely, decline his overtures, and then... 
Ugh, and this is the part I really dread. Then, I go over to the teleporter. I gotta call somebody to get that thing fixed. Don't ask me how I lost my red key in here, I don't really want to get into it. The nightmare starts in E1M3, except I'm being chased by a revenant in full plate mail. Then I'm in a maze where everything looks the same, and there's no gravity, and there are cacodemons staring at me. And then with no warning, I'm sitting in a boat with an imp drinking green tea, and when I try to swim away, I'm teleported to heaven, sucked back down to hell, and have to fend off three archviles with a super shotgun, only narrowly escaping with my sanity every damn night. <sighs> I'd move, but you can't beat this rent. Grade A, difficulty B. Map 13, Keel Hall Handball. I know pirates are supposed to fight dirty, but this scalawag map is armed to the teeth with bullshit. At the start, there's a cackling cross-legged skeleton barring your way to a shotgun, the town is lit up with foes, and critical supplies are guarded by my two least favorite enemies. Interrupting the gargoyle orgy on the inn's second floor will call up four bighorn pimps, and firing a shot in Captain Boner's warehouse wakes up about two bullet drums of gremlins. The plasma ambush dealt me a most undignified death. It's the ultimate fool me once shame on you and a map full of those. In recompense for this embarrassment, here's a soft lock you missed, Donkonk. If Keel Hall Handball leaned more into the playful side it briefly exposes, I would have likened it to Pirate Doom and given it a pat on the back, but nay. Tis a scurvy knave, and worth nary a barnacle on the bosom of me vessel. To the plank with ye! Grade C minus, difficulty B plus. Map 14, the Torture Garden. Velcro Sasquatch, I wish your map was as good as your name. The Torture Garden is a dreary experience that only manages to rise above milk toast by withholding ammunition. Discovering that the chainsaw works on satyrs is all I really got out of this. The claustrophobic layout turns too many fights into bland peekaboos. The secrets are numerous but unexciting and often untelegraphed except for one-sided auto map lines. And the key situation is downright stupid. Look at this. You need a purple card to open this door? And what about these yellow pillars? Nope, my yellow card doesn't work. I need a red one. Okay, I've got a red skull, so will it open this red door? Yes, excellent. Okay, how about this one? Right, of course. Strangely, the titular torture garden is an optional area and, once again, rendered irritating and unscary by the ambient sound effects. player is not the one you want to be torturing, fellas. Grade D minus, difficulty B minus. Map 15, as above, so below. Want to get away? Citri's got the perfect island retreat for you. Two haunted vacations for the price of one. Unfortunately, there won't be much time for camping between killing sprees. As above, so below is full of run and gun action. It's a rare breed for not chaperoning the player with impassable line deaths. A secret backpack even encourages circumnavigating the island. Picking up the rocket launcher unleashes the biggest cloud of gargoyles yet, probably around a hundred of them, and boy is it fun to watch your 90mm anti-tank heat warheads turn into red mist ten at a time. With the red and purple keys, you can jump into the exit cranium, or first track down and activate two switches which reveal a megasphere and yellow key. Survive the quicksand skeletons, get deked by the BFG, fend off some adoring fans, and claim your prize. It's the best way to carve up the final fight in which the map fulfills its title's ominous promise. Grade B+, difficulty B+. Map 16, Return to Castle. Castle Kakostein. Quite dissimilar to the dark and gritty classic upon which its punny title is based, Return to Castle Kakostein opens with a bang, encircling you with tomatoes and stuffing rockets in your pockets. Sadly, the designer's naivete begins to surface shortly thereafter. With few exceptions, Kakostein's traps are sloppy and staged in primitive environments. The red keycard bloodletting may look like a handful, but you can just leave. As soon as you fire a shot into this room, everything wakes up and rushes the door, making the encounter trivial, and then there's one sad arch file in this sore thumb building which you unlock with a switch growing out of the cave ceiling. The first part of the doubleheader final fight is a piece of cake and features probably the most tolerable rockets with legs in the megawad, but what the heck are these skelly and arch file clumps? And why is all this ammo scattered pell-mell around one cyber demon? The bumbling castle Kakostein is more likely to disarm than disappoint, and at least its cheerful midi keeps things light. Grade D+, difficulty B-. Map 17, Norwich Lane. In the 10x10 project, and later Little Italo, Lunch Lunch proved himself one of Doom Mapping's most formidable pastiche artists, but the homonymous Norwich Lane came first. Though it uses some of Sunny666's line defs and his original MIDI, Norwich Lane is a tribute to Morbid Autumn's masterpiece rather than a remake. Like Sunny, Lunch Lunch takes his time leading you to the haunted manor, but his monster count is a hell of a lot heftier, and each toy ambush you encounter on the way to the main event builds tension. Not to say Lunch's fights lack panache, they're just 
just easy, and that's worrisome. It took me three playthroughs to notice the sun subtly setting as you clamber through the canyon. I was too busy taking in ominous portents and gulping at the 400 monsters still unkilled. Cross a gusty gap to unlock the big house and plug your ears, because your bazooka is about to get a workout. Approached methodically and with a healthy fear of power-ups, each layer of this fight can be dismantled with diligent rocket work, but the pair of vials that spawns among the dead at the end of round three is devious and hard to account for. This crescendo of cold sweat completes Lunch Lunch's ruthless ascent to Ad Mortem's throne. Grade A, difficulty B+. Map 18, King Boner's House of Fisting. Ha <laughs> ha. <laughs> Somewhere in going downtown, there's a funhouse that all the zombie men are drooling about. Of course, most of them never make it past the Guts Tunnel or the three gatekeeping skeletons, much less figure out the super shoddy shootable switch puzzle. Tentative boxers will indeed seethe. Punch You in the Face Man plays the deranged carny to perfection, testing your aim against a cyber demon timer and a library primed with running rockets only to reward you with a loot room whose biggest prize is just out of reach. When you try to escape out the service entrance, King Boner removes his face and swallows you whole. It may look like bargain bin toilet of the gods, but this gemstone grotto abyss is almost a pushover with all these rockets and power-ups to gobble. The purple key fight is a thing of beauty, though, collapsing under a caco crescent while shotgunners, spider mama, and one angry cyber blast away. Cowards have the option to flee or pop this secret invuln, but I'd much rather save this for the grand finale. One, two, three, Xylobones! <laughs> King Boner's House of Fisting is much better than the ribald joke it sounds like it'll be. It's truly unhinged, like your jaw after it punches you in the face, man. Ah, oh, it's bad. Grade A, difficulty B+. Map 19, under a bloated fungoid moon. If a lost civilization map were afflicted with lycanthropy, once a month it would turn into something like this. Under a bloated fungoid moon is a sprawling, secret-rich stroll through Blair Witch forests, haunted mine shafts, and acres upon acres of undead real estate. Coffee Achiever compliments his lush environments with a languid pace of play, inviting the player to snoop around and requiring them to retrace steps, but never to the chagrin of short attention Spans. There are a few disproportionately unfriendly moments. The archfile mineshaft bushwhack and this blatantly BS boning by the yellow key come to mind, but most of Fungoid Moon's encounters are mild or easily planned for. Case in point, unlocking this depot with the red skull diffuses the aforementioned skeleton party. On the downside, I would still be wandering these grounds if the auto map hadn't told me what the yellow key was for, and I don't know how a mapper capable of drawing such delicious woodland ambiance could miss slime trails so egregious. The horror. Under a blow the fungoid moon ultimately overcomes its foibles with pure holiday spirit, in the occult sense. This is exactly what I look for on a dark night of October dooming. Grade A-, difficulty B-. Map 20, The Other Dario. Ah yes, Argento. For a map that prioritizes combat to the point of blithe disregard for aesthetics, it's distressingly easy to neuter the other Dario. Washing Machine wants you to panic and charge up the stairs into satyr claws and caco jaws, but if you just don't, the opening momentum disintegrates and never really recovers. No fight can't be fled if you jump off the stairs towards the center, you don't have to ride the skelly down if you don't feel like it, and if you don't mind dipping your toes in Fanta, your ammo problems are solved forever. The timed catacomb fight is the map's most functional, but if you think I'm dumb or desperate enough to archfile jump for both a blue armor and a measly soul sphere, you are sadly mistaken. I don't know what happened to the teleporting cyber demon, but after camping the mastermind and her aide de camp of chain gunners, archies, and children, I did not feel like suffering one more bum encounter. Grade C minus, difficulty B minus. Footnote. Please, please stop with this. Map 21, Don't Cry, Marine. Oh, the humanity. Don't Cry Marine is a goldmine of unintended comedy. Its copy-pasted corridors connect rooms too unrelated to belong together, but too pedestrian to be a convincing abstract nightmare. It's Doom RPG without the novelty, Wolf 3D without the excuse of engine limitations. Not a single decent fight mars its monotony. The only question more pressing than why would anyone need a light amp power-up in this map is why would Guy with Teacup destroy one of the few things that makes his work presentable? There are three light amp power-ups in this map. You may not be chuckling on first playthrough, you may be bored and ornery, and you may want to leave as soon as possible, and that's when you'll find four King Boners stuffed in the exit. I could cry, I could seethe, but I choose to laugh instead. Grade F, 
difficulty B minus. Map 22, Checkmate. Set to a beautiful mitification of the aquarium movement from Camille Saint-Saëns' Carnival of Animals, Checkmate is a combat workshop suspended in a foggy void. You can't castle in check, so before you can enter the massive structure before you, you'll have to outwit a cyber grandmaster and his entourage with a gaggle of jack-o'-lanterns spectating. As his board opens up, Lunch Lunch keeps a hold of the tempo, but he spends an unusual amount of time fooling around between attacks, affected perhaps by Ad Mortem's irreverence. At least his rockets with legs have comedic timing. The involved cage fight with knights, archies, and Saibi Kasparov is Checkmate's most exciting gambit, but don't take the bait. Save a bushel of rockets for the endgame, where the vile strike force will shatter your pawn structure, and by pawn structure I mean your face. The last gasp of pain elementals and fountain of chain gunners in the exit seem a bit jokey, but I think Checkmate had a better potential punchline. Grade B+, difficulty A-. Map 23, Devil Garden. This souped-up warhead harvest gets off to a screaming hot start. Around the Devil Garden, you'll be chased by a small battalion of chain gunners, stomping satyrs, and about a hundred love letters from the bony choir up yonder. Wake up the cyber demon, steal his skull key, and set him to work while you take the teleporter up. Jump scare incoming. After this, Devil Garden refrains from commingling its fights, but each one cranks the volume to 11. Be it with the ghoulish screams of KBs in the Greco-Roman Temple, the thunder of Cyberdemon rockets in the Invuln BFG Bonanza, or the frenzied moves of the final stampede knee-deep in blood. Devil Garden does have one distracting habit. It uses some kind of scripting to initiate fights and open up paths when key monsters are killed. I wasn't aware MBF-21 could do this, and it seems rather undoom like to me, but I digress. Grade A-. minus. Difficulty A minus. Map 24, Autumn Mausoleum? I can't tell if this is advanced punmanship or a mistake, because the auto map spells it without an N. Either way, the seesaw that is Autumn Mausoleum deserves a contorted title. This circuitous map makes a pretty lousy first impression. I started it twice and completed it only once. After getting sandwiched by this corridor, only to discover an ass covering secret plasma rifle after, I began to look for things to complain about. I cracked my knuckles and prepared unfavorable hexen comparisons as I blundered through the castle, unaware of the skull pillars lowering in the starting room one by one as I made progress. I scoffed at the two fake walls, but had to admit Anonymous was onto something with the crawling suspense these secrets elicited. I rolled my eyes at the numerous misalignments, but once upon a time, I too made a map without unpegging a single texture, and the deeper I dug, the handsomer the sights became. By the time I reached the belly of the super crypt, I realized I'd gotten Autumn Masalem all wrong. Gunning down this necromantic deluge would have been exciting enough without a demonic maw puking hell itself out behind you. This fight is riveting, and redeems a map rife with peccadilloes. The slow start is worth sitting through. Grade B, difficulty A-. Map 25, Steeple of Skellies. Skeels? I wasn't aware that my mother made Doom maps, and I gotta say, I'm pretty disappointed in her. Shooting the yellow target in the upper level of this detail-starved church reveals a cursed crystal ball, a weak cutscene, and a secret area that steals Lunch Lunch's move. This fire-bathed obsidian armpit becomes bald-faced bullshit when Archie and King Boner arrive. The lack of cover makes facing them unfeasible until the BFG lowers, at which point the whole map is pretty much kaput. The big frightening gun turns all potential frustrations into pushovers. I suppose it's better than getting mauled by Gremlin and swarmed by teleporting gobbledygook, but still. Why is the rocket launcher being treated like the ultimate weapon? And did you know these bars don't actually block the getaway car? For shame, Mom. Grade D, difficulty B+. Map 26, Chthonic Thesis. In this late megawad downshift, Coffee Achiever offers a relaxing crawl through a crooked Halloween town. Down to the last blind alley, there's a professional varnish on this map. The dead and soon-to-be languish in the streetlight's pale glow, piling up around burn barrels, boxes of junk and rotting bodies while abandoned houses hold their breath. A garrison of purple Schustafel open fire from across Castle Wolfenstein's moat, and archviles study atrocities in secret libraries. Like most of Ad Mortem's locales, Chthonic Thesis has a dark side to uncover. If you survive a Sunday social at the Cacodemon Church, you'll unlock the carnivorous path to the Purple Key. The marines that died here must have been short on bullets or brain cells, because the imps and gremlins that spook you pose no threat. Coffee Achiever's gifted set decoration and restrained combat 
combat make Chthonic Thesis much easier to play than to pronounce. Grade B+, difficulty C+. Map 27, Skeleton Crew. Well, somebody had to do it. For a one-joke premise, Skeleton Crew does all right for itself. I wouldn't have expected two nautical-themed maps in a Hallowad, but Bartek Mill's sector shipbuilding is gawky enough to please, and he's got the good sense not to push his luck with the limited roster. The ring around the bone pit is an amusing slapstick routine, but I have a bone to pick with this cove crossfire. I try to aim for the calcium corsairs that shoot the homingest projectiles first, but lagging teleports make the ship decks difficult to swab completely, and it's easy to stumble into the slime or hesitate to avoid doing so and take a flock of rockets to the bum. Skeleton Crew fails to buffer its major set pieces with interesting things to do, which gives the overall experience a case of osteoporosis. Grade C+, difficulty B+. Map 28, Karen and Barracks. What if I told you that Joe Ilya made one of the best maps in Ad Mortem? The first thing you notice here is the lack of music, which augments the atmospheric SFX and creates a baseline of deep stillness that never gets less creepy. Despite his title name check, Joe Ilya appropriates precious few Karenanisms, just the sewer and the 3D wankery. He loves rockets far too much to ever go full Karenan on ammo disbursement. Joe Ilya's work rarely agrees with modern standards of beauty, but I like his fat sector trees, this morbid picnic, and the drafty castle. Joe even seems to capitalize on the expectation that you'll scoff at his less detailed scenery. I was in the middle of rolling my eyes at this boring cave when the exit collapsed and everything went black. It's a sharply choreographed sequence, and followed by this demolition job, the battle on the self-building bridge, and this secret invulnerability, which slides away mysteriously as soon as you find it. Wonder where it went. Most of Ad Mortem's attempts at legitimate horror fall a little flat, but this bloody dungeon disquiets me. It's partly the silence, partly the dreamlike repetition, and partly the way it dumps you into an Olympic-sized swimming pool of blood. If you found the invuln secret, you can squash one of these hungry hordes for free, but rocket ammo is near infinite, and you have two megaspheres to burn. I still can't shake the shock that this rip-roaring final act is Joe Ilya's handiwork. It's immensely freaky, explosive, and satisfying. Grade A minus, difficulty B. Map 29, Rest in Pieces. Like a pixie stick at the end of a long trick or treat, Rest in Pieces is short, sweet, and makes the kids hyperactive. With the Stew Boy tune and prominent Cyber Demon, it's pretty clear that hand peeled cribs from Ancient Aliens opening map, but this is no copy paste job. Cut through two turret happy challenge rooms without getting arch broiled or snuffed by Cybe, hit the skull switch on the perimeter, and get ready. You and the big guy have to work together to survive the gargoyle tsunami. This is one of my favorite fights in the WAD, an exhilarating, whirlwind of fireballs hissing, rockets detonating, and gargoyles bursting like party poppers. The four bleacher boners are a bit of a buzzkill, but you can always sick side beyond them. Good night, sweet prince. Grade A minus, difficulty B. Map 30, Tears from God. Knowing Lunch Lunch's propensity for dry humor, I always read this title with a touch of melodrama and grin, but Tears from God is not a joke. Two sky-tickling towers of terror and 2,500 monsters lie before you, and it's gonna take a serious plastic pumpkin to collect all that candy. Grape juice cascades from on high, light pulses from malevolent machinery, desiccated trees leer from chiseled cliffs, and multitudes of demons hungrily await their chance to give you your final scare. This is Halloween writ sunder sized. Mega-colossal vistas are interspersed with orthogonal staircase rooms packed to the gills with violence. Behold and tremble as Lunch Lunch conjures downpours of Ad Mortem originals. The squall of skellies descends before you even get a BFG. No less than three satyr stampedes need corralling, and several gargoyle swarms stand by for exsanguination. In the first of three secret fights, Lunch Lunch even achieves the improbable by using rockets with legs for something other than trolling. Although he does that too. Even with foreknowledge and a full BFG, this avalanche of cloven hooves and fidgeting phalanges gave me a lot of trouble on playthrough 2, but the ending is an even more tumultuous affair. The amount of doom experience required to navigate fights like these comfortably is not cheaply bought, but every breathless minute spent dancing in this chiaroscuro of fire and fury makes it worth it. With its spacious arenas and ammo abundance, Tears from God ultimately proves assailable even to doom demigods, but accessibility doesn't dull its spectacle in the slightest. Take a bow, lunch lunch. Great a, difficulty A+. Map 31, The Monster Mash. A jovial and colorful... A jovial and colorful low-stakes send-off... 
Come on, man. A jovial and colorful low-stakes send-off, the Monster Mash is a neon sandbox rave that doesn't take the icon of sin too seriously. Round up a copy of each skull key, activate the switch in the center for a BFG and free invuln, then climb the stairs and slip a couple of rockets into the goat wall's head hole. Grade B, difficulty B. So, Ad Mortem may be uneven, but it's never uninteresting. It bursts with Halloween festivity, offering enough blood to satiate the Gorehounds without putting off the types who prefer It's the Great Pumpkin Charlie Brown to Hellraiser. The plentiful custom content calibrates this wad for seasonal play, but the Gargoyles, Skellingtons, and KBs work well all year round, and as much as I railed on the satyrs and running rockets, they present a novel challenge and flavor Ad Mortem distinctly. I would recommend this map set to anyone looking for a rough-and-tumble grab bag, or anyone who's looking to spice up their Halloween with something other than cinnamon, nutmeg, grain of salt, and ribbix. My final grade for Ad Mortem is a B. Difficulty-wise, this was a tough one to gauge since its difficulty curve is scribbles, but I settled on a B because its extremes on both ends balance out. Now for my Dean's list. Valedictorian, Map 30, Tears from God. Salutatorian, Map 12, Every Damn Night. Class President, Map 30, Tears from God. And the dunce cap goes to Map 21, Don't Cry Marine. Thank you all very much for watching, and have a happy Halloween. Now, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge my generous patrons. Aaron Allen, Agile Jackson, Agoo XYZ, Alephany, Alex Topfer, Alpha Skeeter, Artisan Talzar, Beatbeard, Birdburn, Blexor, Bitefire, Kappa Bitch, Captain Wave, Cheese Wheel, Christophine Place, Cutman Mike, Demo, Dan, Delirium, El Inferno, Endless Moose, Fez, Francis T218, Galaquack, General Roasterock, Gothic Box, Griffin Upchurch, Henner's Lenners, Hot Tomato, Idiot Supreme, Jeff Hibbert, Jeremy Francuz, Jimmy Paddock, Josh Ballard, Jude, Just Some Schmuck, Just Great 98, Killplane, Quan, Large Cat, Lexi Max, Lumnal, Livin' Dead, Man with Gun, Mancubian Candidate, Mark Rowland, Master Drew 117, Matt G, Matthew Gower, McJimbles, Michael Akins, Michael Jensen, Miracle Water, Mixer, Moco Mothman MM47, Mosicon, M Essex, Mullywiz, Neurometry, Nick XCOM, Number 26, Not Obelisk, NX Avery, Omnibot, Painful Hill 72, Pengerzan, Pezavengjaj, Philip Coffee, Foo, Princess Entrapta, Red Doomed Earth, Reese, Reese Anderson, Roadworks, Rufy, Salt Bad Guy, Santu Pasonin, Saf Needs Coffee, Sean Grant, Snacker Fork, Some Spoony Bard, SR388, Stonemason, Stupid Nick, Sylvester Priss, Taracushino, The Lippy Server, TJG1289, Turbine 2K5, Velenex, Video Game Lover, Wandering Autumn Leaves, Why Be Mo Not a Crab, and William Huber. Thank you. I appreciate you all. This is Mount Payne 27, and I'll see you in the next episode of Dean of Doom.